Hey, you're listening to Sean of the South, and I'm your host, Sean Dietrich, and we are coming to you live via the radio and the podcast airwaves all over the nation. You are listening to our 50th episode right here on the same stage that Hank Wins performed on 80 years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, the Goat Hill String Band. our mail tonight, a little bit of our mail sent in to us from listeners all over the nation who had nothing better to do than to sit down and pin us some sincere sentiments from the heart. Start off with Rachel Wanamaker from Detroit, Michigan. Rachel says, there's something about sitting on a porch listening to a radio. I have my grandfather's old radio that he used to repair whenever it broke. He must have repaired this thing a hundred times. The thing is older than I am by at least 30 years. It's all wood. My husband retrofitted it so that when I hook up my cell phone, it will play music or podcasts through the same speaker my granddaddy once listened to. And I can sit on this porch and I can listen to my grandfather's radio. And in this case, I'm listening to your show and pretend that I'm back in the 1940s instead of the fast-paced life we live in. Sometimes I get so tired of technology. Your regular listener up here in Detroit, Rachel. Dear Rachel, I mirror those sentiments almost exactly. Sometimes I long for the days of radio before television took over the world and before cell phones took over the television. Alan Grass, Decatur, Alabama. I'm not a real mandolin player, but I wish I was. 
My mother played a mandolin along with my father. There was this one time that a man came through town, and he was a friend of my mom's cousin. He came over to the house, and he was an upright bass player and a guitar player and an accordion player. And we had ourselves a real old-time jam session. But my father didn't like this man because this musician was young and handsome. And it seemed like my mother was always very excited whenever he came around, and she seemed to be having too much fun, I think. So, whenever they came through town again, my father refused to invite this man over for any more jam sessions. Anyhow, I got my mom's old mandolin, and I play it sometimes, but I'm, I'm too old to learn new tricks. So I just toy around with it, and I do this because it reminds me of her. Soren Gustafsson, Minneapolis, Minnesota. When are you coming to Minneapolis, Sean? It's cold up here, but one good thing is that, well, never mind, there aren't any good things up here. <laughs> but come up to Minnesota anyway, I'll show you around, and I promise my sister and I will attend your show even if it's in the back of the barn somewhere and nobody else attends. She hooked me up with your show not very long ago, and I really want to say thanks for it. So... In short, my friend, go north, young man, go north. Dear Thorn, when I do, I promise you will be among the first to know. Arnold Jenser, Hickory, North Carolina. Sean, I listened to your very first show, and I followed it through to the end of your archives, and it took me a whole week to listen to your stuff. I've been on the road for eight days heading toward Oregon to see a long-lost cousin I didn't even know I had until just recently. She's a relative of my father's, and she grew up with him. And I never knew her, but now that my father has passed, he just died last year, I'm trying to reconnect with anything and everything that he was connected with. So anyway, thanks for the shows. Thanks for the, the partnership on my ride to Oregon. They remind me a lot of stories my daddy used to tell. Sincerely, Arnold. Dear Arnold, that is a high, high compliment. Amy Toothaker, Birmingham, Alabama. Dear Sean, I just wanted to thank you for your radio show. I look forward to new episodes each Saturday. However, I've found that a great added benefit of listening to your show is that I've been traveling for work for some time and I can never sleep well in strange hotel rooms. I've discovered... However, if I listen to a show that I've already heard, the next thing I know, I'm out like Lottie's left eye. It's better than any sleep medication on the market. I guess that makes me feel just a little more at home hearing a familiar voice who sounds like where I come from. So thanks for helping a girl on the go to get her beauty sleep. I'll be home for your next episode. I promise I won't sleep through that one. Your friend, Amy. Madison Loosestone, Bloomington, Indiana. My son is a college graduate as of this summer, and I have never been so proud. The graduation was small, and there were only six other students who graduated during the summer semester with him, but it was so emotional. My son did some time in juvenile detention not very long ago for some youthful things he did that he shouldn't have done, but he came out on the other side a different kid, a good man and responsible, gentle father of one young daughter who is my pride and my joy. I am so proud of him for completing his degree in English. English. He wants to teach English in high school if he can get a job because he knows kids and he has been there. So wish him luck. His name is Jason. Dear Jason, good luck and may you one day mold young minds into the grateful students that you are yourself. Grace Holtzman Hoover, Alabama. Sean, I saw your show live and even I brought my kids to see it. My oldest son thought the band was the coolest thing he'd ever seen in his life. He went home and he started practicing on his dad's old guitar. He can hardly play a note. It's a nice guitar. It's an old Martin that my dad got at a thrift store a long time ago because the young man selling it didn't really know what he had in the way of guitars. So my son is 14, and he has made a promise to himself that he's going to learn how to play. And one day, God willing, he wants to play on the stage with you. That's his dream. 
Dear Grace, tell your son to aim a whole lot higher, a whole lot higher, than playing up here with us, because we are bottom of the barrel entertainment. And I suspect one day, one day he will discover this. But, but, when he is ready, so are we. Send him our way. Love, your pal, Sean Dietrich. Smitty Randolph, Columbus, Georgia. Sean, I want to wish my son a happy 27th birthday. He's overseas right now working with a tech company. He listens to your show because he says it helps him feel closer to home. And so now I listen because I know that he and I are at least listening to something together, if not maybe at the same time. So he and I are sharing this experience together, even though we're at opposite ends of the earth. Please tell my boy that this message is for him. Chris, I love you, and I'm wishing you a happy one. You've made me a happy man from the day you were born. Thanks, Sean. Thanks very much. Lenore, Brooklyn, Kansas. My husband decided to get off the Internet this week for good. He's 42, and he's trying to reconnect with the old ways. So he hid his cell phone... And he only does landline phone calls now. I bet him that he would only last maybe a few hours tops. Anyway, things were going pretty good. He watched more TV than he normally did, and he even read a book, which is something my husband does not do. In fact, I rarely see him without his cell phone in his hands. But he was doing all right until I found him early this morning, and I'm talking it was 5.30 in the morning. He was in the kitchen browsing Facebook and eating corn chips. And I busted him. And he was like, no, 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 I was only checking my email. And I was like, yeah, right. And so, Sean, his great disconnect from the online world only lasted a grand total of a day and a half. And I am just here to tell on him. Jody Haynes, Fredericksburg, Tennessee. My daughter took me to her school last week. And I was supposed to talk about my career. And the thing is, I, I don't have a career. I'm a housekeeper. A housekeeper is not a career you tell young girls to aspire to. And my daughter insisted anyway that I go to this parent's career day. I ended up talking for a few minutes and then telling a story about my childhood. And something funny happened to me. I started to feel less aware and ashamed of what my job really was as a housekeeper and I started to feel empowered because I am a mother and I'm really good with kids and the kids were starting to laugh and I realized that this is one of my talents and so Sean I have decided because of my daughter's prompting that I'm going to go to school and I'm going to become a teacher even if it kills me because this is what I ought to be doing with my life and I know this now and my daughter is the one who I thank for it. So, anyway, kids are smarter than I think I am sometimes. What do you think about that, Sean? Dear Jody, be proud of who you are, sweetheart. Cleaning houses is a noble profession. Good luck on your school in the future, and good luck, and God bless those children who will sit in your classroom because they are going to be lucky children indeed. And that's letters from our listeners. We're going to have another tune here from the Goat Hill String Band, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, the Goat Hill String Band. Yeah. 
80 years ago, about 80 years ago, in this same room that we are all in tonight, and on this same spot up here on the stage, you can't see it, but there's, a, there's an X made from tape right here on the stage where I'm supposed to stand so the light will hit me just right. 80 years ago, Hank Williams and his Drifting Cowboys played on this very stage, this very stage. I feel something I can't even describe to you right now. You see, I was kind of a wayward kid. Nobody really knew what to expect from me. I didn't really know what to expect from myself, I guess. It was a long time ago I can remember sitting on my granny's porch, her front porch of her single wide trailer, and she was sitting with her legs crossed and a Lucky Strike cigarette unfiltered between her fingers and a line of smoke was drifting toward the heavens and on a little side table beside her ashtray was a crossly radio with a little tweed-wrapped speaker that was blasting forth music from Grand Old Opry on a Saturday night. My granny loved the Grand Old Opry almost as much as she loved Billy Graham. The world stopped for two things, for the Opry and for anything that the Reverend Graham had to say. This was the pinnacle of the week. The Grand Ole Opry popped through that little, that little speaker just the same way that all the old radio shows had that came before it, like Your Hit Parade. My granny loved Your Hit Parade. When she was younger, she would sit in front of the console radio and she would listen could sing along with all those songs from your hit parade, but nothing, nothing touched her like the Opry. Because my granny was a country woman, and country people have their own tastes in music, they have their own tastes in entertainment, and the Grand Ole Opry was a barn dance, a weekly barn dance for anybody in America who wanted to join. And I remember watching her tap her foot in rhythm with the Opry and listening to the voice of the announcer coming through at the time it was Keith Bilbrey's voice. Keith Bilbrey announced the Opry and I was entranced with sound. Sound. It was a completely aural art form, radio. And she loved it. My granny was the kind of woman who didn't talk a whole lot. She didn't talk a whole lot because she was what they call wistful. In fact, I'd never even heard that word applied to anybody else except my grandmother, wistful. It means people who are, who are very quiet, people who don't, they're, they're felt rather than, rather than heard. And so people like this have a great deficit in their life and they need to fill it with sound. These are the kind of people who like radio. My grandmother smoked every day of a cotton picking life from the age of 12, I believe it was. She came from a generation that did not feel guilt about things that were bad for your health. I fear we know too much. I fear this society knows just too much about what's going to kill you. We know too much about what you should and shouldn't eat so that you can't really eat anything today. This knowledge has corrupted Thanksgiving and turned it into a hellish holiday. You got family members, you got family members who all pile into one room and everybody's got a different diet. You got pescatarians and vegetarians and vegans and, and people who are on the Paleolithic diet. And then you got people who are on the Neolithic diet. And then you got folks who are on the Middle Ages diet which is only brown bread and beer that you have manufactured yourself through barley grown in a hydroponic machine in your attic. (laughs) We have all these special diets so that nobody can gather together in one room and just eat from the same big fat turkey. They don't eat the same things that people that are from our grandparents' generation used to cook. They don't eat the ham salad that looks like reconstituted pink brill cream. They won't eat that tomato aspic, which is really just reconstituted floor wax. They won't eat oyster stuffing, oyster dressing, because it tastes like it was scraped from the hole of the USS Uruguay. And so they will eat food they've brought themselves, 
a grain loaf that has been mashed into one big bag and dried on the hood of your car until it resembles the, the end of a very big piece of pork sausage. Only it tastes nothing like pork sausage. It tastes like the shoe from a man who wanders around in a full cattle pasture all day. Everything's changed. But my granny's generation, they were different. They felt no guilt. They could eat all the things we don't eat anymore with, without feeling any remorse. They could eat saturated fat. They could eat unrefined, unrefined white flour. They could eat white sugar. They could eat egg yolks. They could eat mayonnaise and bacon. And they would feel, they would feel perfect afterward and they would sleep like a baby at night. And contrary to medical opinions, they, some of them would live well into their 100s. <laughs> My grandmother loved the sound of Minnie Pearl's voice, perhaps above everything. There was nothing greater than the sound of this woman who used to come to the speaker and she would say, Howdy! And of course, that line that she always knew she was going to say, I'm just so proud to be here. My grandmother loved it. She loved that line. Everybody in my family loved that line, and they used it all the time. I'm just so proud to be here. It didn't sound like something you'd hear in a comedy routine. It sounded like something that was fit for a fellowship hall on a Wednesday night. I'm just so proud to be here. It sounded like something that was fit just before prayer. Or something that was fit for a little church out in the stick where the preachers roll up their sleeves and loosen their ties and remove their jackets before they do a healing service. Where they baptize folks in the river out back. I'm just so proud to be here. That's what it sounds like to me. But it was part of Minnie Pearl's comic routine. And she was funny. The woman could make you laugh. I remember most of her jokes. Because my granny would turn it up when she was talking. Minnie Pearl. There was the joke about the country couple who brought their family into town. They hitched a ride from a man who lived next door, and they rode all, all the way through the dirt roads and the sticks to see the brand-new courthouse, which had been constructed on the edge of town. They walked into this courthouse, which was enormous and gargantuan, with big columns out front and a big staircase leading into a marble lobby. And the mother and the father and the children all split up, and they just admired this piece of architecture and the mother stopped with her daughter and they looked at these silver doors embedded in the wall and a little old man walked toward them silver doors and he pressed a button which was lit up on the wall and the doors slid open he stepped in the doors shut and after a few moments the doors opened again and a young man walked out who was six foot five with broad shoulders and curly hair and dark olive skin And that old country woman looked at her daughter and said, Go get your daddy. (laughs) Minnie Pearl had that joke where she would she would approach that tall cowboy, slender cowboy with dark tan skin and a guitar strapped around his chest. He was about six foot nine with with lean gaunt features. He was handsome. And she looked at him and she said, I bet you I could kiss you. I bet you a dollar I could kiss your cheek so fast that you wouldn't even see it. He said, a dollar, huh? Well, I reckon I'd like to see that. Let's try it. And so Minnie Pearl gave him a dollar to hold. And then she commenced kissing him. She pressed her lips against his lips, and she held that kiss for a long time, holding that man by the ears. And when she finished, she released his head, and he looked at her, and he said, Well, that wasn't fast, and that certainly wasn't on my cheek, neither. That was right on my my mouth. And she said, Well, you can't win them all. (laughs) Many pearl, many pearl. Oh, my grandmother loved many pearl. I'm just so proud to be here, many pearl would say, and I'd be out in the backyard making mud pies. And my granny would say, I'm just so proud to be here, right in unison with Minnie Pearl. And I'd say it back to her, I'm just so proud to be here. And I kept saying it and kept saying it until she'd say, shh, shh. Conway Twitty is fixing to play. And Conway Twitty would sing his anthem, his anthem, hello, darling, glad to see you. 
And my grandmother would just listen with her eyes closed, touching a fresh Lucky Strike cigarette to her old Lucky Strike cigarette and looking upward at her little porch ceiling while the music played. What I'm trying to say is I love you. And I miss you. Come back, darling. I'll be waiting for you. My grandmother believed in cigarettes as part of the nutritional pyramid. (laughs) It's just the way country people were back then. Their absence of remorse and guilt would just allow them to live life with a little bit more freedom than we do. In her pantry, she had things arranged in order of nutritional importance. For instance, she had the flour and the salt and the sugar and the cornmeal and the Coca-Colas in the bottle. She had the peanuts, the peanut butter, and they were all labeled on the shelves of her pantry. And just next to the Hostess Twinkies was a label that read cigarettes. <laughs> Lucky Strike cigarettes to be exact. They were right next to the Twinkies, and I, I love Twinkies, you see. Twink was very important to me as a child. In fact, my mother says that I learned how to say Twinkie before I learned how to say Mama. (laughs) I was a fat child, and fat children learn how to to prioritize their vocabulary from a very early age. My mother says I learned how to say the word pound cake before I learned how to pronounce Jesus. (laughs) That's true. I can remember closing my eyes at night to help myself fall asleep and I could see a little illustration of Twinkie the Kid. He was the mascot. He was the mascot for the Twinkie uh, box and he had a big 10 gallon hat on and his steel like face with lean sharp features and his well oiled six shooters on his hips. Twinkie the Kid. I wandered into my grandmother's pantry one day looking for Twinkies when nobody was looking, but a grave clerical error had been made on that particular day. And instead of Twinkies sitting over the Twinkie label, there were Lucky Strikes. (laughs) Now, to a young, young boy, there ain't much of a difference between Twinkies and Lucky Strikes. They, They resemble each other very, very similar products indeed uh, that Lucky Strikes come just like Twinkies individually wrapped in colorful packaging that is very alluring to a child I reached up and I grabbed what I thought was something similar to a Twinkie and I ran for parts unknown my grandmother chased me she chased me they tell me I had eaten about 12 cigarettes before my granny caught me Twelve, and she spanked me. She played the drums on my hind parts, but I didn't even really feel it because I had such a strong buzz going on in my head from them cigarettes. <laughs> and to this day, whenever I eat a Twinkie, I have to look around for an ashtray. <laughs> my grandmother, she she set me upright and she looked me in the eye. She said, "Do you know why I'm swatting you, child?" And I just, all I could say was, I'm sorry, Granny. She said, well, well, the Lord forgives, honey, but I need you to know why I'm swatting you. Do you know what you did wrong? She said, these were Granny's special Twinkies that you stole. And I I don't want to ever see you touch these things until you're at least 13 years old. (laughs) And so I went for a long time without eating Twinkies. Yes, yes, I can remember. I can remember sitting on her porch eating Twinkies, watching the radio speaker, because that's what you did when you listened to the radio. You, you watched it. I can remember listening to Minnie Pearl talk. You know, I've seen Minnie Pearl once in my life. I was just a boy. We were living in Spring Hill, Tennessee. My father was working at the, he was building the GM plant. A steel working man, a welder, a stick welder every day of his life. He had a torch in his hand and a helmet on his head. He came home one night covered in soot and filth. He said, get dressed. We're going to go see the Opry tonight. And my world lit up like a bona fide Rockefeller Christmas tree. He got showered. He put on his nice clothes. 
we hopped in his truck and we drove about 30 minutes, 30 minutes to go see the greatest show on earth. I saw men in cowboy hats playing the fiddle, steel guitars, and I saw Keith Bilbrey standing behind a podium announcing the whole thing, telling the audience when it was time to, to make some noise. And I listened to music. I don't even remember what I heard. I just remember how it felt. And when it was finished, I remember my father taking me out to this large area where all of these people were swarming around country music stars. And there she was. There was that hat with the price tag hanging off. Minnie Pearl herself. And people were shoving little pieces of paper at her and they were waiting for her to autograph the paper. And she posed for photographs and flash photography and my father inched us forward to her. He reached into his pocket. He had himself a little receipt that he'd been carrying with him. Just a receipt from a little stop we'd made at a service station on the way to the opera that night. He bought a moon pie and I had bought, a big surprise, Twinkies. He handed that receipt the many pearl. Lord, I will never forget it. He said, my son, uh, he's a big fan. He'd like your autograph. The many pearl reached her arm around my father. And she held him and she gave him a little hug. And then she kissed him on the cheek. My father, many pearl, kissed him on the cheek. His face turned about as red as a Venus eagle cherry. And my father could not think of a thing to say. He never was very good under pressure. He said, I'm just so, so, so proud to be here. <laughs> she must have heard that at least a hundred times every day. She signed that little slip of paper and we walked out of that place and I was floating above the ground. Yes, there's something to be said for those little old radios that sit on those side tables I can remember when I first decided I wanted to do this. And I can remember my granny, who was at a fellowship hall. A fellowship hall full of people. I can see the fellowship hall just as clearly as I can see the opera stage in my mind when I hear an old grand old opera radio broadcast. It's a little fellowship hall covered in linoleum floors with, a, with an asbestos ceiling and there's a water fountain in the back and there's, there's a little single bathroom with one little toilet that you've got to walk sideways just to get in because it's so small it's about the size of a walk-in closet. They used to call it the water closet, not even a bathroom. I can see the little kitchen with the orange appliances that had been donated to them by the, by the appliance store just up the road. It's a little little church way out in the sticks and my granny walked me into the church I could see her wearing her pearls around her neck and her frilly hair she always wore the same kind of dress outfit my grandmother had paralyzed one of her vocal cords from smoking too many cigarettes so her voice was one octave deeper than my, my grandfather's and at the holidays she would answer the phone and she would say this is Sam speaking and people would say Sam is that you? And she'd say, this is he. She'd say, well, you sound a whole lot like Boris Karloff. <laughs> My grandmother, with that low voice, she could sing Bing Crosby music if she wanted to. <laughs> I can remember that, that woman, she was frail, small, and wistful. She didn't say much. My mother once told me that one of my grandmother's friends, in speaking of my grandmother, said, even a fool is perceived very, very wise if he keeps his mouth shut. Your grandmother is so wise. And even if she wasn't wise, everybody would think she's wise because she's wistful. She keeps her mouth closed. My grandmother, she placed food on that potluck table line. And I stood in this room full of God-fearing Southern Baptist. There's a string band in the corner. They were playing gospel music. It was a lot like the Opry. They were singing through a tiny little microphone that was running, a cable was running from that microphone into a small suitcase size amplifier. And it was projecting. It sounded like a little transistor radio. And the pastor came up to my grandmother and he said, would you do us the honor of saying a blessing? And my grandmother the quiet woman with the low voice 
She said, oh, I don't think so. He said, oh, please, please. And so my grandmother walked up to that little tiny microphone sticking up off that chrome-coated stand with a cable running to that suitcase amplifier. And she said, would everybody bow their heads? And when her voice came through that little speaker, it sounded like she was coming through a radio. Everybody bowed their heads except for me. I just watched her. I watched that little, that little five-foot woman who weighed maybe 90 pounds sopping wet. She said, Dear Heavenly Father, we're all just so proud to be here. <laughs> what a woman. When she passed, it was in a hospital room. She was hooked up to a ventilator. She could not speak because of the tubes running out of her body and her throat and her mouth. But she looked at my mother just before she passed, only minutes before she passed. She, she took her two left fingers, her index finger and her middle finger, and she tapped them against her lips. Smoke, she mouthed. I want to smoke. And then she breathed her last. Beautiful, beautiful country woman. The generation of people who taught us how to just live. The people who were not vegetarians and vegans and paleolithic diet eaters. They were just people who picked themselves up every morning. They survived the Great Depression. They survived the Bowl Weevil. They survived the Dust Bowl. They survived economic disability. And they, they, just, they survived a world war. And they still managed to produce Hank Williams. They still live on. Not long ago, not long ago, a friend of mine suggested that we buy some recording equipment in a classified section of a paper. It was $57 for a few microphones and some cables. Because he, he knew that I had a lifelong dream to kind of be on, on a radio. I said, this is crazy. Nobody listens to radio anymore. He said, yeah, but they listen to these things called podcasts. I said, it's nuts. He said, what you got to lose? 57 bucks? You ain't going to live forever. If you don't do this now, you might never do it. And so, without knowing what we were doing, and what you are listening to right now is our 50th episode, our 50th broadcast I haven't done anything of note in my life. But by God, I'm here right now. Standing in the same place that Hank Williams himself stood. And you are here. And we are here together. And that's got to mean something. That's got to mean something. Being here right now. I'm going to admit to you, I have no idea what I'm doing. (laughs) None whatsoever. But, but, I am just so proud. Proud to be here. 50 episodes. Not too bad. I have you to thank for it. Thank you very much for having me here tonight. I am so proud to be here. Thank you, everybody. Hey, thanks for listening to Sean of the South. I've been your host today, Sean Dietrich, and it has been a bona fide pleasure. What you have just heard was our 50th podcast episode and radio broadcast. 50 might not sound like much to you, but it is a grand landmark for us because we did not expect to make it past two episodes. We're a ragamuffin group of fellas, and we have somehow managed to scrape together 50. If anything, there must be something higher at work here, perhaps it's caffeine. 
The music you heard behind me today was the Goat Hill String Band, Alabama's own treasure. Patrick Reed, Aaron Peters, Fred Clements, and Kelly Fowler, also in love and memory of John Garman, the founding bass player of the Goat Hill String Band. These guys have been together for a long time, and they are not just good, they are Alabama good. Do yourself a favor and look them up at GoatHillStringBand.com and find out where they're playing in your area, either the Birmingham area, the Montgomery area, or anywhere else in a small town around here. The show was recorded live at the Mount Vernon Theater in Tallahassee, Alabama, and it was the same stage Hank Williams himself played on about 80 years before us, and it was a true, true pleasure. To find anything more about what I do, you can visit SeanOfTheSouthShow.com to find all 50 of our past episodes. And while you're there, I hope you take the time to drop me a line. Tell me about your birthday announcements, wedding announcements, any special event happening in your life, church potlucks, and even bar mitzvahs. And I'll do my best to read them over the air for my friends, because I love to do that stuff for people that I like. And speaking of friends, friends, 50 of something mediocre is a whole lot better than none of something incredible. Adios.